Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Round Series. Uh, there are several housekeeping announcements I have to make before introducing today's speaker. Our Grand Round Series is a semi granting activity, and you should use the e system to claim your CME certificates. If you have any questions or difficulty with the system, please contact Nicole Myers. If you have a question for today's speaker, please use a question and answer feature. The speaker will be asked those questions after this presentation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our own Dr. Michael Carsey. Dr. Carsey is an instructor in neurosurgery at Drexel University College of Medicine and Global Neurosciences Institute. He treats a variety of tumor, vascular, and spine pathologists throughout minimally invasive endoscopic and traditional open microsurgical approaches. He completed his residency at the University of Utah. In addition to training, he completed a fellowship in minimally invasive and complex spine disorders treatment. Afterwards, he completed a skull-based and neuro-oncology fellowship at Thomas Jefferson University. And today, Dr. Carsey will be discussing the topic of neuro-oncology. Dr. Carsey. Thank you, Dr. Glebus. I appreciate the opportunity. It's a pleasure being here uh, and chatting with you guys and, and sort of showing some of the work uh, we've been doing uh, in neuro-oncology. I thought this could be a neat update on to, as to some of the things that are uh, going on in this field. Um, these are some disclosures that are not relevant. I thought we could uh, talk a little bit about some of the um, recent updates in gliomas. I think this um, gliomas certainly serve as a real model uh, disease for a neuro-oncology. And I think some of the changes and uh, developments in that field really uh, trickle down to many of the other types of tumors um, and things that, um, that that are being done. And, and the other part of the talk, I, I think we could talk a little bit about pituitary adenomas and some of the work that we've done uh, as well. Um, you know, back in 2011, um, Hanahan Weinberg published a, a popular article at the time discussing some of the uh, challenges in oncology in general, some of the resistance mechanisms that uh, cancer takes to uh, avoid um, uh, treatment and, and sort of uh, progress. And since that time, you know, 10 years later, the number of different mechanisms that uh, cancer cells can actually take on to avoid treatment um, and recur um, serve as aggressive things that that become difficult to treat patients. And as soon as this list of different molecular mechanisms has continued to expand, I think anytime you look at a cancer that's not really um, got a cure or, or has a very difficult treatment, and you ask sort of why that is, it's, it's one of these reasons. It's usually several uh, of these reasons that are on this slide right here. And so any kind of treatment, I think that targets only one or two of these pathways is, is ultimately, I think, going to be unsuccessful in completely curing or or um, making a huge impact on tumor, simply because tumors have so many different of their mechanisms to avoid treatment. And in neuro-oncology, I think a lot of that has started to really take hold. Um, the newest development is the WHO uh, classification of uh, uh, central nervous system tumors really has started to reflect that there are molecular underpinnings to these tumors that play a very big role in how they, how they work, how they progress. And so, a lot of the pathological definitions of the past have now led way to molecular characteristics. And below, you can see a table that lists some of these key genes that are now being, um, you know, really important in identifying these tumors. And and this is going to continue to to develop further. You know, we have um, methylomics and genomic classification now that is continuing to um, improve how we can understand these tumors. And to talk a little about gliomas, and certainly this is a, a very common type of malignant brain tumor. Um, there's different grades from two to four with worsened survival and high grade tumors is affected uh, members of both political parties and, and high levels of office. It's a very um, pervasive disease. It has had a lot of impact on society. In 2012, the, the thought with how these tumors progress is shown here. And basically gliomas are defined as primary or secondary types with primary types uh, thought to be glioblastoma, secondary types thought to be low-grade gliomas that progress over time to become glioblastoma. And you can see some of the mutations that have been associated with these tumors. But now let's skip forward to 2023, and you can see this classification system has completely changed. It is a completely different way of thinking about these tumors. IDH mutant or isocitrate de dehydrogenase, a key enzyme in the Krebs cycle, has really become the key factor used to define um, low-grade versus high-grade tumors, uh, aggressive versus non-aggressive types of tumors, and that has become an important gene that's now used to classify these tumors. And on top of that, there are several other very, very specific gene mutations uh, shown on this slide. 
as well as chromosomal alterations that have really been shown to become um, pathognomonic for certain tumors. And so you can just see in, in just 10 years time, the classification system, our understanding of how these tumors work and their aggressiveness has completely shifted. And this is another slide sort of depicting over that time period, how the different components of genomics uh, research have gone into understanding these tumors. You can see kind of earlier studies in the early 2000s, doing early microarray studies, helping to define some of these um, sort of artificial classifications uh, based on the genetic uh, patterns that these tumors were uh, seen. And again, genomics research is great. Methylomics research is fantastic. How you translate that to clinical work is, is a big challenge. Um, you know, and isocitric dehydrogenase, I think, was a really important tool because it became one key mutation that you could use in IHC, uh, immune histochemistry, or, or uh, DNA screening, PCR, to be able to really identify tumors. And it really put a fork in the road that became very clinically useful. So you can see how the classification system really shifted after this discovery. And now if you look at kind of the more recent classification, as we've learned more, these the genetic underpinning is how we discuss these, these tumors amongst the neuro-oncology uh, groups. And then how do you treat these tumors? Well, this, I wanted to start with just a case that we did here. This is a 51-year-old female that presented with seizures and aphasia, was found to uh, have what we suspected was a low-grade glioma shown here in the left uh, frontal lobe. Uh, because of sensitive location and the difficulty she was having with her speech, she underwent a wake mapping to uh, resect what we could get safely. And we'll talk a little bit about what maximal safe resection is and studies that support it and kind of how do you think about these kinds of tumors. Ultimately, this became an IDH wild type type tumor. So it was a high grade type of uh, tumor and she underwent treatment with femazolamide and fractionated radiotherapy, did, had a great recovery with no language deficits. And, um, and I think this is sort of the newest phase of how we treat these tumors. So what is maximal safe resection? Well, glioblastoma is classically been described as resection of the complete enhancing portion of the tumor, whereas with low-grade gliomas, we talk about resection of the T2 or flare abnormalities. What are the different things we use to treat that? Well, we have neuronavigation, where we help to target to a tumor. We have um, neuromonitoring that helps us, uh, whether a patient's awake or asleep during surgery, to make things safe. We have ultrasound and other kinds of modalities we can use in surgery to hide, try to preserve neurological function as much as possible while still achieving these, these goals of resecting as much of the actual tumor as possible. Multiple studies have shown that the more of these tumors uh, you get out, the better the survival. Um, this has been studied for you know, 10, 20 years and has been shown that over and over again, if you do this, um, patients, patients do better. But important to that is also that complications after brain surgery hinder survival. And this is a study that we did specifically looking at um, elderly patients that were treated with uh, treated for glioblastoma. Uh, you know, the, the gross total resection rates in a real population aren't going to be 100%. percent you know, This is about only 23% of patients had a gross total resection. And survival was, was very poor. I mean, this is a group of elderly um, patients. One of the things that was really important was that any patient here that had a complication, whether it was a major or minor complication, it, it diminished their overall survival simply because it delayed their, their progression to chemotherapy and radiation. And this has been shown over and over again in different types of gliomas and younger patients, uh, regardless of what group you look at, complications really have a big impact in, in this patient population. Um, some of the newer studies have started to look at what, what is the impact in cognitive uh, impairment for these patients and looking at how they first present, as well as the cognitive impairment they get after surgery. And again, showing that if you have patients that have any kind of cognitive impairment, whether before or after surgery, it really does have an impact on their overall survival and their quality of life. So what are other tools we use to try to identify key pathways in, in tumors and try to protect them? One of them is, is tractography. This is a tool using um, diffusion imaging to help identify water molecules uh, basically going in um, a particular direction and then color coding it to identify specific fiber tracks. So you can see here in the middle figure, different fiber tracks that are um, visually seen that are well known in, in the brain. And you can, you can see that these fiber tracks are across the entire brain. So it's a very complicated network. How can you sort of understand this? Well, these fiber tracks can be defined into white matter tracks that are really important to function. Some of these different tracks shown here, um, but for example, the cortical spinal tract, this is well known for any kind of motor pathway and everyone 
uh, for medical school onwards of those that if you disrupt any of the fat, you know, pathways of this tract, you can impair uh, their uh, patient's overall uh, motor activity. And some of these other tracks are less understood in terms of how they affect function after brain, brain tumor surgery, but they have important roles. There's, there's thousands of papers talking about these different pathways that um, impact higher cognitive thinking. And we're just beginning to understand how they even um, impact um, in clinical patients. We, we're not, we don't have sensitive enough measures many times to look at what these other pathways are doing, but they do play a role. And this, um, these pathways then connect into uh, seven um, canonical kind of network, um, brain network. And the brain doesn't function as an individual area of firing at one time or another, that there are actually six um, areas of the brain that, that sort of wire together and, and function together to form um, cognitive thinking and different uh, functions. And these are some of those networks here we, we, we summarize in a review article. This is the detailed list, which I'm not going to read through, but you can get a, a sense of the of the, the pathway, some of which are very clearly seen in, in any kind of pathology from brain tumors to stroke, where you can have impairment of language, sensory motor function, um, and visual fibers. You know, these are these are easy ones to measure clinically, but some of these other ones, such as central executive function, default mode, salience, dorsal tension, and limbic, paralimbic pathways, these are more difficult to measure clinically, and they often require more higher level cognitive psychological testing to be able to identify. And that those studies are starting to come out where we can actually easily study these pathways and then actually see after brain tumor surgery, how do, how do patients get affected? So this is a review we wrote about different uh, surgical strategies to be able to get to tumors while preserving these key pathways. So you can see different surgical approaches where you try to preserve these key pathways and sort of understand the borders of where these pathways are around specific tumor locations and different uh, cranial approaches can be designed around this. Um, and so you know, this is an example of how all that information sort of comes together. So this is a, a patient treated here. Um, this is a 61 year old gentleman who presented with right-sided weakness, was found to have a left frontal lesion. He ended up uh, having advanced Im imaging at uh, one of our centers and Dr. Teitelbaum, one of our neurologists was gracious enough to sort of provide this case and, and these slides. And showed that you know this this is a left uh, frontal lesion sort of located around the caudate. Um, the differential for this could be certainly glioma, lymphoma, low or high grade is difficult to tell. Um, certainly, these are these are the questions you want to ask because it just it does change how you manage this surgically. So this patient underwent three Tesla imaging to better identify what the tumor looked like. They also went advanced imaging. Uh, called um, perfusion imaging. Basically, this uh, looks at the impact of um, boluses of contrast and uses modeling to help identify how much does that area of the brain pick up uh, contrast or, or blood flow. And, uh, you know, tumors that are higher grade have more blood flow, they have more vascularity, so you can use that to identify tumors. The patient also underwent spectroscopy, which is basically where you can look at the magnetic spectra and you can identify different molecular molecules within it. Um, and then um, all this was sort of put together and, and suggested this is high grade, high grade glioma. The patient underwent trectography, we just talked about to look at some of those key fibers that were around that um, tumor to be able to give it the, the safest corridor to either get a biopsy or resection. And ultimately, the patient underwent a successful uh, resection. This was done by one of my partners, um, Dr. Sarkar, and he, uh, he did a great job by resecting this. And the and, um, patient had you know, no deficits from this and, and uh, did very well and helped identify kind of what kind of tumor this was. And I, certainly the imaging and the planning goes into getting a successful outcome. And that's kind of what this, what this helps show. So what are some of the other things we can use for treatment of these tumors? Well, th there's been this question of recurrent uh, um, surgery for recurrent tumors. This is a very recent study showing um, that in patients who've had recurrence of tumor, that uh, undergoing resection of, the, of these patients does show uh, improved outcomes. So Certainly the, you know, whenever we do see these patients, we always sort of counsel them that this is a complex type of disease. This is something that requires consultation oftentimes with um, a team of oncologists or radiation oncologists to go over different treatment options. And uh, we, we sort of think of every patient, every treatment option at any time we see them. And certainly there's roles for additional surgery in, in some patients. What about chemotherapy? You know, standard therapy for this has been temozolomide. Uh, it's about a, a, um, a six-week therapy of temozolomide uh, with radiation, followed by six months of consolidation therapy. 
Um, and certainly the, the, um, the sort of level one evidence to support that radiation plus temozolomide is effective. There have been other types of chemotherapies, carmucin wafers, which have been popularized out of uh, Hopkins where they were developed, also have good evidence uh, that, that, that they can be effective. The PCV therapy is, is a little more toxic of a therapy, but it's um, also sort of classically been described. More recently has been the description of uh, a, a treatment called uh, tumor treating fields or optum. Basically, these are low intensity um, um, intermediate frequency electric fields that help to disrupt the microtubulin, which is polarized in cancer cells, helps to disrupt their growth. First shown in, in you know, obviously in petri dishes and lab cells, and then later shown in, in humans to be very effective. And there's a level one evidence study showing that uh, tumor treated fields, in addition to temozolomide, mm -hmm. uh, can be very effective for, for patients. Uh, the, certainly the, the Definitely, you know, the cons of this are that these patients have to wear these electrodes for 18 hours a day. They have to start treatment uh, right away, um, and it's very costly. The insurance does cover this, but it is a very costly treatment. Um, so there, you know, it's not for every patient, but it is. You know, we don't have a lot of level one evidence studies in this field, and this is one of them. So this is something we certainly talk to patients about. One of the most recent studies in gliomas. This is in low grade gliomas. Has been a type of a treatment of racinib that helps to target IDH um, um, mutant protein, basically, the, the 2-HD protein. It helps to target that. And it's um, basically uh, it was studied in uh, um, low-grade gliomas, grade 2 gliomas that ha had not undergone any previous treatment. Usually radiation becomes a treatment for patients who have a low-grade glioma that has a, that has a subtotal resection. Um, um, so this is a treatment that was initiated and did show improvement and progression-free survival sort of inhibited the progression of these tumors for, you know, you know 27.7 months. So, you know, had a, had a uh, fantastic result, um, did have some uh, side effects, but, uh, you know, certainly to be expected and, and, um, certainly a treatment that's going to be very exciting as this becomes more, um, useful clinically. Uh, immunotherapy is, sort of the hot button um, topic in many uh, types of tumors that we treat. Unfortunately, in many brain tumors, it's had a lot of limitations. It hasn't had tremendous impact. There are several types of immunotherapy. Uh, one of the um, classic ones that have been described as passive immunotherapy were basically monoclonal antibodies targeting a specific protein, such as VEGF, EGFR, you know, gliomas, glioblastomas also have VEGF uh, V3 mutations, which all of these have been targeted with different monoclonal antibodies. Amongst them, VEGF inhibitors or Vastin um, are, are sort of something we still use as a second line treatment. These are the original Kaplan-Meier curves from the study that, that looked at the Vastin, showing that it didn't impact overall survival, but did have an improvement in progression-free survival. So we typically use that you know, uh, VEGF or Vastin as a second line therapy, but it does have significant toxicity. It inhibits wound growth, uh, sorry, wound healing after surgery, and it and it has um, blood thinning properties as well. So it, it isn't without complications. The problem with immunotherapy is that the blood-brain barrier really inhibits the ability for these large monoclonal antibodies to enter in and, and have an impact. So some of the uh, additional more new newer treatments have been um, vaccine therapies as well as immunotherapies targeting PDL1, PD1, and CTLA4. So shown here are the different treatment options that exist. These are really blockbuster drugs that have changed how we treat uh, many of the systemic diseases, but have had a real limited role in gliomas and glioblastoma. These uh, treatments basically target co-secretory uh, receptors on T cells and the tumor uh, cells themselves or, or antigen presenting cells. And you can see some of these um, and, and monoclonal antibodies and what they're exactly targeting. But the clinical trials ultimately with, with um, brain tumors has been very limited with how, how effective these different monoclonals have been. Many, many groups now are trying to look at how are, what are the other mechanisms that um, cause that resistance and sort of can you overcome them with additional treatments? Can you add additional molecules to be able to overcome this resistance mechanisms in gliomas? It's still a very um, active field. And uh, one of the last ways for immunotherapy is adoptive immunotherapy. So chimeric antigen receptors or CAR T cells, you may or may not be familiar with, but these are exciting developments in the treatment of leukemias, basically the harvesting of uh, tumor cells as well as um, peripheral T cells using um, 
engineering methods to, to get a patient's own T cells to be able to target a tumor cell and then re-injecting those T cells. They've, they've had tremendous impact in many types of blood borne diseases, but uh, have very limited impact so far in uh, brain tumors. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that is. So the, the field of immunotherapy s simply is is ongoing with, with brain tumors and neuro-oncology. It is actively uh, being looked at, but it's, it's, it certainly has some limitations. One of the um, clinical trials that our group has looked at is the role of intra-arterial avastin. Basically, like we said before, avastin has been used as second-line agent. So using it intra-arterial is potentially one mechanism to deliver a much higher dose with less systemic toxicity. This is an example of a 53-year-old uh, male who basically uh, underwent resection of glioblastoma and then um, had uh, concerns for recurrence. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I actually, had, he had a complete resection, and I think this is just post-op imaging. I apologize. And he uh, basically underwent uh, left MCA intraarterial vastin therapy, showing uh, in tremendous impact at just 24 hours with uh, with this therapy. You can see sort of the overall left MCA run where the tumor is sort of present, as well as a selective run where this treatment really can be given directly to a, a artery that that feeds this this tumor. And this this idea um, could be very interesting also for many of the monoclonal antibodies or um, other types of targeted agents and immunotherapies that are being developed um, may be able to give much higher doses that, or, or, or you know, combine this with ways to disrupt the blood-brain barrier to get these treatments directly to where they need to go. So this is really exciting to be able to think about how you can use some of the advances in endovascular neurosurgery to also then treat neuro-oncology patients. There was a phase one trial looking at this tumor, which showed um, their um, you know, overall survival was sort of what you expect for these patients in the population, but didn't re report any adverse outcomes. So certainly this technique is, is, is worth kind of taking a look at. Uh, one of the other areas that I think is warranted in studying of gliomas um, and other types of brain tumors is sort of what is the effect of you know, the social uh, issues around a patient and how does that affect outcomes. So this is a systematic review that we initially looked at trying to understand um, how the different databases that exist in the, in the U.S. that are studying uh, glioma, kind of what, what have they summarized. And we looked at 122 papers. And, and one of the things that we found very interesting as we kind of look through this is that there are many, many prognostic factors that study after study over 30 years, 40 years have um, really shown uh, to be impactful for outcomes. So race, marital status, insurance status, patient, uh, you know, where the patients are treated, hospital volume, those have impacted patient outcomes for decades over and over again. And these disparities that we see in healthcare um, where certain races and certain socioeconomic statuses such, such as lack of insurance impact outcome, those have been seen for this patient population for decade after decade, and, and they still persist up to today. So there's certainly some challenges, and I think gliomas as a model disease help to, you know, pave the way a little bit for many of these other fields and trying to understand how to how to um, how do we make treatment better for all types of tumors, not just this kind. So in summary, for this part, you know, what works for gliomas: maximal safe surgery, adjuvant therapy, radiation therapy, some of the newer treatments such as Optune, IDH1 targeting. Um, you know, exciting developments, you know, year after year. And, you know, I'm not showing the slide of all the things that have been tried that didn't work because there are a lot of people working on these types of tumors that, um, you know, many of the things that failed don't, don't make it to prime time, but there, there's been a lot of effort to try to improve treatments for this. Um, and what what's a sort of elephant in the room that, that needs to really be addressed? Well, it's the social uh, access to care. That's a, that's a really big factor for this type of tumor. Uh, especially in the Philadelphia area, but also nationally. And I think that still is a uh, ongoing thing that needs to be to address. And I think gliomas for neuro-oncology serves as the, the model treatment. I mean, th this has the most amount of studies, it has the, the best funding. And so the developments that occur in this field are going to really have an impact on how do we study other types of, of brain tumors. And so I think it's interesting to think about. One of the other areas that I'm really passionate about is, is skull base and, and uh, the treatment of different types of skull base tumors. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the developments in pituitary adenomas. These are uh, very, very common types of tumors. They, occur, they account for up to 10% of brain tumors, sometimes up to 20% of um, um, tumors uh, or even pa patients uh, can have one of these. Uh, there are many different types. Most of these end up being non-functional or non-hormonal secreting. 
Uh, and they're and they're sporadic. I mean, most of these patients just they're living their normal lives and present with one of these at various stages. Well, the genomic understanding of adenomas has shifted how we think about these tumors. They're now really defined as pituitary neuroendocrine uh, tumors or PIT nets is what the newest um, you know, label for pituitary adenomas is. And we've been able to identify that transcription factors uh, shown here, but most importantly, T-PIT and PIT1 are really important for identifying which type of pituitary tumor someone is um, likely to develop. And so these transcription factors are, are have been put into the um, WHO classification of these tumors, but um, these aren't used clinically very often. I think only high volume centers or, or research centers are probably using these transcription factors to define these tumors. Uh, we still mostly rely on the hormonal profiling to understand these tumors, but you can start to see how the genomics, uh, the genomic understanding of these tumors is shifting how we are going to start to understand them. Uh, there are different ways to surgically resect them. You know, um, the microscopic uh, strategy to resect them is shown here. It, I think it has a very limited view, but it's it's a tried and true method. It's very effective. There's um, ample studies looking at different surgical ways, microscopic versus endoscopic, and overall they show that um, you know the outcomes are are more or less equivalent. You can see an example of how microscopic resection is performed using fat at the end to sort of uh, close off a, a wound. Uh, you can use two hands by manual traction. And the endoscopic method of treating this, uh, we use uh, four millimeter size endoscopes to get to the back of the nose, it improves visualization, but it's it's a technically more demanding type of procedure. Um, something I'm very passionate about developing. I think that there's a lot of role for endoscopic therapy to Im uh, improve outcomes by improving visualizations. You can see with a 30 degree scope, right, you can inspect the cavity to make sure that the cavity is completely cleared. Uh, and, and the opening is tiny. I mean, this is a, a tiny little opening to be able to get those, um, that sort of outcome. The endoscopic approaches can be expanded to other areas of the skull base shown here. And I won't belabor the different types, um, but you, know, you, you can see the labels here. More or less, um, when you think about these pathologies, you sort of just tailor the approach to where the pathology is and you remove bone or structures to get to where it is. But this is a very versatile approach. This is an example of... Uh, how we use this approach in a patient that had uh, a giant pituitary adenoma. And so you see a 65 year old gentleman who presented with altered mental status and vision deficits. We just dif discussed different types of surgical approaches. Let me skip to the video. The, uh, this is done in conjunction with uh, one of my ENT colleagues who um, initially did a, a transeptal approach, basically removing the cartilage in the septum, identifying the cartilage of the bone to give us a surgical corridor. Um, you know, this opens up the corridor to give you a lot of space. It's, it's, it re requires some technical ability, but it's, uh, it can be done fairly well. Here we're making incision at the back part from the sphenoid os uh, across the septum to mobilize a nasoceptal flap. I think this was, this is definitely the case that we um, moved the flap, but we ended up not needing it. So, so you can see how the flap was sort of mobilized in, into the coena and preserved so that if you do get a leak, or any kind of um, need for reconstruction, you can always bring this up. So now we're widening out the bone at the back of the sphenoid sinus. We open it up widely. You can see the dura of the of the cella shown here where the pituitary tumor is. Traditionally with giant adenomas, you, 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 people have talked about transcranial approaches to remove these. They're very challenging tumors um, because of how big they are and how far north and superiorly they spread up. But here with this very small corridor and specialized instruments, you can sort of start right at the bottom let the tumor sort of collapse down and, and get this thing to sort of fall towards you. And you can see you know, through the video various techniques that we use. So initially using a dissector, a ring curette to um, remove tumor. This is, you know, a grasper to, to safely kind of remove tumor that you can see, um, you know, very safely. And then um, you can see as you suction to the back of the, the wall of the cavity, so the back of the cell, the dorsum cell is here and you can kind of carefully remove capsule and parts of the tumor. So let me skip a little bit ahead. I wanted to just show some of the other techniques that we use. So this is a four-handed technique. We're using two surgeons and four hands as a team to be able to do resection uh, using suctions and um, a dissecting instrument. Uh, we can also use uh, these specialized curved and malleable instruments to be able to really reach up. And this is what I think gives us the advantage of removing these tumors in a way of avoiding a, a large cranial surgery, we have to remove 
part of the patient's bone, you can use these instruments to really reach up and try to sweep a tumor down very safely. And I think these are very, very effective tools to be able to, to do that. Um, and, you're, and you're using it to feel. It's not blind sweeps. You're actually using it to sort of feel out where the tumor is and, and carefully bring it down towards you. Um, let's skip forward a little bit more. So again, 30 degree scopes that can help you kind of visualize this sort of type of lesion superiorly. And then let me just skip to the end. Um, you know, this is how we, we have various ways of reconstructing this using uh, various, uh, you know, very, various tricks to sort of re reconstruct this, which could be a whole nother lecture. But um, let me just show you the, re the result at the end, which is uh, here. Basically this patient uh, post-operatively looked like this kind of outcome, uh, you know, the, the, the optic nerves were significantly improved, decompressed. And then at 10 months, you can see just residual scar tissue without any recurrence. So a pretty good outcome for, for just an endonasal approach on this patient. One of the exciting things um, coming out of uh, our work on pituitary adenomas has been the formation of, of a multi-signature registry called RAPID. This is a rapid, uh, this, this is a, a registry of a sort of high volume centers, centers of excellence, people doing a lot of research on skull based and pituitary tumors, um, of which I've been a part of uh, now for several years. Uh, you know, this is a, a list of the uh, different centers that are involved. And our goal is to adopt a little bit of what's been done in other types of tumors, but to pool our resources and pool our clinical data to be able to better study how do you treat these patients. Um, and so this is uh, one of our initial studies talking about this vision to transform both pituitary uh, adenoma research as well as other skull-based research, but to really do it as a um, collaborative group, to be able to put everyone's thoughts together, to be able to come up with the best um, study to be able to, to, to push the needle forward. And um, as of recent, and this, this registry has about 4,000 patients in it. These are the different studies that we've so far have either um, submitted that are being presented as talks in the next year or have been submitted for manuscripts and, and many, many more are sort of being developed out of this. Uh, I was gonna only highlight one of these studies as kind of a, a model of, of what we've, we've been able to do. This was a study that I did looking at uh, surgical frailty. Basically surgical frailty um, is defined as the patient's uh, the decline of physiological reserve and, and a sort of decreased ability to cope with stress. Um, it originally defined by several, by five factors, including weight loss, uh, exhaustion, low physical activity, slow gait, and weakness. But more recently, because of the advent of administrative databases, research databases, EHRs, people have really used these frailty indices to help identify um, frailty indexes. And as of, of as current, there are about 75 different types of frailty indexes, so th definitely a very big field. Uh, why is this important? Well, this is going to become an important part of treating every patient because our population is getting older. Um, we're finding that the, the advance of uh, patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s is going to continue to expand. You can just look at some of the other countries around the world where this is happening faster than here, and you can see what impact that health has on their healthcare system. But it's going to be happening here, and you're going to be dealing with more patients that are older that are that are going to be frail and, and making clinical decisions on how to treat them on in every type of disease. And in neurosurgery specifically, frailty has had a, a, a tremendous impact. Um, there are over 25 studies. This is as of 2020, looking um, at uh, different frailty indices showing that, that it affects everything, every kind of disease. Um, it it, it uh, is correlated with high mortality, higher length of stay, worth it, worse than discharge disposition, uh, and it cuts across all types of diseases. And so one of the challenges in skull base, but in, in many other types of fields, is how do you intervene on patients that, you, that need treatment when they have frailty? So what we did was look at the rapid registry, trying to assess uh, how frailty impacted outcomes. And this is data from 2011 through 2013. We use the modified 11 factor frailty index and divided into three scores. And this is only mild. We looked at fit, managing well, and mild frailty. We did not have any high frailty type of patients. This is, this is, these are only patients. Um, we only had enough to be able to look at mild frailty. Um, specifically looking at Cushing's disease, this is a rare disease. So by being able to pull everyone's data together, we actually had enough volume to be able to study this in a way that couldn't be done before. And then we looked at primary outcomes such as length of stay, disposition, and, and complications. As you sort of expect, patients that have frailty or are older 
Um, these are some of the other characteristics about these tumors. You know, most of these patients were NOS grade zero tumors, which basically means they're microadenomas. They're tumors only within the, 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 the cella or the pituitary uh, location. Um, you know, these higher NOS grade lesions are more complicated. They sort of invade around the carotid artery. They're harder to treat. And so this is a, a population that I think is very representative of the rest of how these patients arise. Most of these patients underwent endoscopic resection as, um, you know, other studies that we didn't discuss kind of show this has been the interest in in this kind of um, mode of resection for these tumors increasingly endoscopic surgery is being used and what we found um, is that increased frailty and increased length of stay and increased likelihood of disposition to a nursing facility and an increased risk of venous thromboembolism so in, on all these factors it um, it impacted patients. And this is, again, mind you, only mildly frail patients. These weren't even the most frail type of patients. We also had looked at um, multivariate analysis, co uh, controlling for various comorbidities, tumor size. I'm not showing you that data, but all, you know, our multivariate analysis also showed that, that frailty really cut through the noise and, and had a huge impact on outcomes. And how do you use this? You know, it's one thing to just say a patient's older and, and, and more frail, but you still have to treat them. What, what can you do to try to improve their outcome? We looked at some of the modifiable factors. We looked at A1C, we looked at um, a diabetes status um, and functional status. And, and we looked at, um, this is basically a scatter plot looking at preoperative A1C and length of stay showing that patients who had higher um, uh, A1C had a higher length of stay. And you can see that the more frail patients, again, are presenting with higher A1Cs. Um, this is a multivariate analysis looking at length of stay and discharge disposition showing that functional status or basically the ability to ambulate or walk as well as diabetes really impacted these, um, these outcomes. So looking at this data, we, we, it suggested to us that modifying or improving diabetes control or getting patients some sort of um, prehab, some sort of physical therapy to get them more, more mobile before surgery may be a way to sort of improve their outcomes after surgery. It's not something that you can always... Um, you, know, you don't have enough time sometimes or, or resources to be able to impact. And that's another challenge for healthcare. So you're taking this information and impacting healthcare decisions, but at least we could find that there are some modifiable factors that can make an impact. Um, and so in conclusion for this part, we basically did show that these uh, frailty and disease impacted outcome. This is one of the first studies to be able to even, have, even study this in Cushing disease, which came from multi- institutional studies, you know, hasn't, we haven't been able to really study this before. And then we also um, showed that there were modifiable factors to be able to impact this. So I, I think this sort of work really comes at the, um, and sort of on the shoulder of the work that patients uh, have, uh, is, that researchers have, have done with gliomas. And I think you're going to start seeing a lot of the work in different aspects of skull base and different you know, sort of orphan neuro-oncology diseases sort of follow the same pattern where we sort of better understand how the genomics of these um, diseases work. We look for therapies that can potentially target tumors based on those pathways that are being Im impacted, and then um, doing larger collaborative studies to better understand how to treat these patients, both from a clinical, surgical, oncological standpoint, as well as from a targeted uh, treatment standpoint. So this is, uh, these are some of our partners that we work with. Uh, we've been really instrumental with the treatment of any of these patients um, at uh, some of the hospitals that uh, I work at. And uh, they've been tremendous uh, to, to help and, and collaborate. And um, thank you very much. I think we ended up a little early, but uh, hopefully I can get everyone to their, the rest of their Friday. Thank you, Dr. Carcia. Uh, thanks for this great overview. I have several questions for you. Um, so, <laughs> You know, with all the advances of the glioma treatment, what do you think are the biggest barriers or, or challenges that why aggressive glioma still have such a poor prognosis? That's a great question. I mean, and, and I think it's it comes back to that those original pathways that Hanahan Weinberg talked about. There, every time we've we've tried to treat gliomas and glioblastomas, every, even in the lab, when I remember doing a lot of targeted therapies of one pathway or another, you could you could very clearly see this tumor. Uh, could just circumvent those treatments and come up with another way of progressing. And that's what we see clinically is that once you start treating with one pathway, one type of targeted agent, um, these tumors progress. They, they don't express a lot of surface molecules that are easily targetable. 
they um, can go into senescence. So even if they're initially rapidly dividing and you start targeting them with chemotherapy radiation, they can go into senescence and just wait. And then once you're done with your treatment, they regrow. And then they're very, uh, you know, the, the problem with any kind of cancer is if it's too similar to normal tissue, um, anytime you treat cancer, you're going to target normal tissue and cause side effects. And so these tumors have an ability to sort of hide within the brain. The immune system can't target them well. The um, Our treatments can't differentiate between normal and abnormal very well. So that's kind of why they've, they've been limited. Um, I did highlight a little bit of some of those social factors for these tumors. I mean, there are some things we can do to improve outcomes that doesn't require a, a phase three trial. I mean, simply getting patients to high volume centers, simply getting them good care, insurance coverage, you know, simple, simple things. I guess not so simple, but, you know, it really is just getting a patient's good care. It really makes a big impact right now. You, you can, you can definitely see that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the local delivery of chemotherapy and uh, where do you see it going? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great current, question. Yeah. It's a great question. And certainly my endovascular colleagues can speak high, you know, better to that, but there's, there's certainly been a lot of work in oncology looking at conduction, um, enhanced delivery, basically trying to, uh, you know, um, get past the blood brain barrier. People have also looked at uh, focused ultrasound to disrupt the blood brain barrier with micro bubbles, different frequencies. Um, mannitol is another thing that has been looked at to disrupt the blood brain barrier. So there are these treatments that we know of that can try to disrupt the blood brain barrier. And now we have advances in endovascular therapy, microcatheters can get to the smallest blood vessels that didn't exist even 10 years ago. So you have this sort of, um, this, this group of technologies now coming together, you advances in targeted therapy, endovascular therapy, as well as our lessons learned from prior attempts to avoid the blood brain barrier. And so you're going to, I think, see a lot more exciting um, options start to develop for these kinds of targeted therapies, not just in even gliomas, but in all types of tumors, you're going to start seeing this, I, I believe. You mentioned that there are some barriers in adopt adopting CAR-T in neuro-oncology. What are those? I think the barriers really are the immune system. There aren't enough specific antigens on gliomas and glioblastomas to be able to target them very well. Um, so these tumor cells, we've looked at the surface markers, we've looked at the, you know, how, you know, targeting uh, antigens, and there just, there aren't that many that are specific enough to gliomas to be able to target them with CAR T cells. Um, there are some um, abscopal, what's called abscopal effects from immunotherapy. Basically, when you start treating systemic disease, either with immunotherapy or radiation, there are some examples of brain tumors, metastatic brain tumors that, that get better. So we do know that the immune system can cross the blood-brain barrier and it has an impact. We just don't understand how yet. We don't, I think there's a lot of unclear um, mechanisms of how that works. And then these tumor cells themselves present a challenge where you can't specifically target them. Okay. Uh, Dr. Carson, thank you very much for this great talk. And before we close today, I would like a couple more minutes of the audience's attention. Um, as a host of today's Grand Rounds, I stand before you with the mixed emotions for this was my final address in this role. Um, over the years, it has been an immense privilege to bring you various topics and insights through these talks, serving as a platform to connect and learn from exceptional speakers in our medical community. I want to thank the GNI family for this opportunity and their support. I want also to express my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you who joined us. Together, we have explored groundbreaking research, innovative treatment modalities, and pearls of wisdom from revered experts in various fields. We have grown, expanded our horizons, and refined our approaches to patient care. As we approach the end of the year, I would like to extend my warmest wishes to all of you um, through this joyful holiday season. Next year, the Global Neurosciences Institute of Grand Rounds will continue to provide a platform for the exchange of ideas, the sharpening of the skills, and celebration of medical advancements. It has been an honor to serve as your host, and thank you and farewell. Thank you.